Talk Read Aloud, which happens every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday at noon, where we're reading books. Everybody's welcome to come, but we're trying to aim for the eight to 10 year old age group. And I know some of you are still doing homework now until like one o'clock, but during the summer, you might want to tune in to us at noon o'clock doing noon doing a read aloud. So today I decided to start with The World According to Humphrey. Now he's a hamster who lives in a classroom in a school. The first chapter, it's by Betty G. Burney. Chapter one is The Return of Mrs. Brisbane. Today was the worst day of my life. Miss Mack left room 26 of Longfellow School for good, and that is bad. Worse yet, Mrs. Brisbane came back. Until I, today, I didn't even know there was a Mrs. Brisbane. Now, I want to know, what was Miss Mack thinking? She must have known that soon she'd be leaving without me, and that Mrs. Brisbane would come back to room 26, and I'd be stuck with her. I still like, no, I should say, I love Miss Mack more than any human or hamster on earth. But what was she thinking? You can learn a lot about yourself by taking care of another species, she told me on the way home the day she got me. You'll teach those kids a thing or two. That's what she was thinking. I don't think she was thinking very clearly. I'm never going to squeak to her again. Of course, I'll probably never see her again because she's gone, gone, gone. But if she comes back, I'm not even going to look at her. I know that last sentence doesn't make sense. It's hard to make sense when your heart is broken. On the other hand, until Miss Mack arrived, I was going nowhere down at the Petorama. My days were spent sitting around, looking at a bunch of furry things in cages just like mine. We were treated all right. Regular meals, clean cages, music piped in all day. Over the music, Carl, the store clerk, would answer the phone and say, open to nine, nine to nine, seven days a week. Corner of Fifth and Elder next to Dairy Maid. Back then, I feared I'd never see Fifth and Elder, much less Dairy Maid. Sometimes I'd see human eyes and noses and not always clean as they should be poking up against the glass. But nothing ever came of it. The children were excited to see me, but the parents usually had other ideas. They would say, come see the fishes, Cornelia, so colorful and so much easier to take care of than a hamster. Or, no, 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 Norbert, they have the cutest little puppies over here. After all, a dog is a boy's best friend. So there we were. Hamsters, gerbils, mice, and guinea pigs. Not as popular as the fish, the cats, or the dogs. I suspected I'd be spinning my wheel at Petorama forever. But once Miss Mack carried me out the door a short six weeks ago, my life changed fast, fast, fast. I saw Fifth, I saw Alder Street, I saw the dairy maid with the statue of a cow in an apron outside. I was dozing when she first came to Petorama, as I do during the day, because hamsters are more active at night. Hello, a nice warm voice woke me up. When I opened my eyes, I saw a mass of bouncy black curls, a big happy smile, and huge dark eyes. She smelled like apples. It was love at first sight. And she said to me, aren't you the bright-eyed one? And might I return the compliment, I replied. Of course, when I said it, it came out like squeak, 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 as usual. Miss Mack opened up her purse with the big pink and blue flowers on it. I'll take him, she said. He's obviously the most intelligent and handsome hamster you have. Carl just grunted. Then Miss Mack picked out a respectable cage. Okay, not the three-story pagoda I had my eye on, but a nice enough cage. And soon, amid squeals of encouragement from my friends in the small pet department, from the teeniest white mouse to the lumbering chinchilla, I left 
Pet-O-Rama with high hopes. We sped down the street in Miss Mac's bright yellow car. She called it a bug, but I could see it was really a car. She carried my cage up the stairs to her apartment. We ate apples, we watched TV. She let me run around outside my cage. She gave me my very own name, Humphrey. And she told me all about room 26, where we were going to be the next morning. And since you are an intelligent hamster who is going to school, I have a present for you, Humphrey, she said. And she gave me a tiny little notebook and a tiny little pencil. I got these for you, she said, at the doll shop. She tucked them behind my mirror where no one could see them except me. Of course, it might be a while before you learn to read and write, but I know you're smart and I know you'll catch on fast. Little did she know, I could already make out some words from my long, boring days at Petorama. Words like chew toys, kibble, pooper scoopers. Remember, a hamster, hamster is grown up at about five weeks old. So if I could learn all the skills I need for life in five weeks, how long could it possibly take to learn to read? I'll tell you, it took me a week. Yep, in a week, I could read and I could even write a little with my tiny pencil. In addition to schoolwork, I learned quite a bit about the students in room 26, like lower your voice, AJ, and speak up Sarah, and wait for the bell Garth, and golden Miranda. Even after I found out that her name is really Miranda Golden, I thought of her as golden Miranda because of her long blonde hair. After all, I'm a golden hamster. Yes, life in room 26 suited me well during the day. My cage had all the comforts a hamster could ask for. It had bars on the window to protect me from my enemies. I had a little sleeping house in one corner where no one could see me or bother me. And then, of course, there was my wheel to spin on and a lovely pile of nesting material. My mirror came in handy to check my grooming and to hide my notebook. In one corner, I kept my food. The opposite corner was my bathroom area because hamsters like to keep their poo away from their food. Who does it? All of my needs were taken care of in one convenient cage. At night, I went home from school with Miss Mac and we watched TV or we listened to music. Sometimes Miss Mac played her bongo drums. She made a tunnel on the floor so I could race and wiggle to my hamster's heart content. Oh, the memories of those six weeks with Morgan McNamara. That's her real name. But she told her students to call her Miss Mac. That's how nice she is, or was. On the weekends, Miss Mac and I had all kinds of adventures. She'd put me in her shirt pocket, right over her heart, and take me to her laundry room. She had friends over and they laughed and they made a fuss over me. She even took me on a bike ride once. I didn't have any idea until this morning of the unsqueakable thing she was about to do to me. On the way to work, she said, Humphrey, I hate to tell you, but this is my last day in room 26. And I'm gonna miss you more than you'll ever know. What was she saying? I hung on to my wheel for dear life. You see, it's really Miss Brisbane's class. But just before school started, her husband was in an accident. So I took over the class and today she's coming back for good. Good, I can see nothing good in what Miss Mack was saying. Besides, Humphrey, I want to see the world. Fine with me. I thoroughly enjoyed all the world I've seen so far. And I would go to the ends of the earth with Miss Mack, but she wasn't finished yet. But I can't take you with me. Besides, the kids need you to teach them responsibility, and Mrs. Brisbane needs you too. Unfortunately, she didn't tell Mrs. Brisbane about me. Mrs. Brisbane was already in room 26 when we arrived, and she smiled at Miss Mack and shook her hand, and then she frowned at me and said, is that some kind of a rodent? Miss Mack gave her the speech about how much kids can learn from taking care of another species. Miss Brisbane looked horrified and said, I can't stand rodents, take it back. That it she was talking about was me. 
Miss Mac didn't bat an eyelash. She put my cage in its usual place next to the window and said the kids were already very attached to me. Then she attached a book to the side of the cage called The Guide to the Care and Feeding of Hamsters. And there was a chart to make sure that I was fed and my cage was cleaned on time. The children know what to do. You won't have to do a thing, she said, as Mrs. Brisbane glared at me. Just then, my fellow students came streaming into the room, and within a half an hour, Mrs. Mack had said goodbye to everyone, including me. I'll never forget you, Humphrey, she whispered. Don't you forget me either. Not likely, but I don't know if I could ever forgive you. I squeaked, and then she was gone without me. Mrs. Brisbane didn't even come close to my cage until recess, and then she walked over and said, Mr. You gotta go. But she doesn't know. The latch on my door doesn't work. It never has. It's the lock that doesn't lock. So I've got news for Mrs. Brisbane. If I gotta go, it'll be when and where I decide to go, not her. Meanwhile, I'm not gonna turn my back on this woman. Not for a second. If I ever disappear and someone finds me, finds my notebook, just check out Mrs. Brisbane, please. I wrote in the book. Tip one, choose your new hamster's home very carefully and make sure it's secure. Hamsters are skillful escape artists and once they are out of their cages, they are very difficult to find. I am gonna be very difficult to find. Chapter two, nightlife. For the rest of the day, I felt sad, sad, sad. You look sad, Humphrey, Golden Miranda said, when she was cleaning my cage right before lunch. According to the chart that Miss Mack had left, it was her turn to take care of me. Thank goodness. Miranda was the best cage cleaner and never said, yuck. She put on throwaway gloves and then she cleaned my potty corner. She changed my bedding, gave me fresh water, and finally, Oh, joy, she gave me some fresh grains, some fresh lettuce, and mealworms. This will make you happy, she said, as she slipped me the special treat she had brought from home, cauliflower. Naturally, Miranda had good taste. I promptly saved it in my cheek pouch until I could store it in my sleeping house. Hamsters like to stash food for the future. After my cage was taken care of, I felt well enough to look at Mrs. Brisbane more carefully. Now, Miss Mack had been tall and she wore bright colors, short skirts and high heels. She wore bracelets that jingled jangled. She spoke in a loud voice and waved her arms and walked all around the room and she tore. Mrs. Brisbane on the other hand was short with short gray hair. She wore dark clothes and flat shoes but she didn't jingle jangle at all. She spoke in a voice just loud enough to hear and sat at her desk or stood at the chalkboard when she taught. No wonder I was feeling sleepy after lunch. All that nice food and all that soft talking. Is, is that all this hamster does, she said, sleep? Well, he's ternal, replied, raise your hand, Heidi Hopper. Raise your hand, Heidi, what's ternal? You know, ternal, he sleeps during the day. I was wide awake now, and I squeaked, nocturnal. Hamsters are nocturnal. Oh, you mean nocturnal, said Mrs. Brisbane, almost as if she had understood me. She turned and wrote the word on the board. Can anyone else name an animal that's nocturnal? An owl, that's correct. An owl is nocturnal. Anything else? A voice shouted out, my dad. Mrs. Brisbane looked around. Who said that? He did, AJ. Garth pointed at AJ. Both boys sat at the table nearest my cage. What about your dad, Mrs. Brisbane asked. Well, my mom always says, my dad is nocturnal because he stays up so late watching TV. Everybody started to laugh, but Mrs. Brisbane didn't even crack a smile. Her use of the word is correct, though technically humans are not nocturnal. Any others? Eventually, the class came up with more names of nocturnal animals like bats and coyotes and possums. 
the Mrs. Brisbane said the class would be learning more about animal habitats later in the year and their habits. If she would just look at me, she could learn a lot. But I noticed for the rest of the day that she stayed far away from me as if I had a disease or something. She read us a mighty fine story in the afternoon, though. In fact, I couldn't get back to my nap afterward. It was about a scary house and these scratching noises and a ghost. Thump, thump, thump. The ghost came down the hall. Oh, I had the shivers and quivers. I have to say, Mrs. Brisbane knows how to read a story. Her voice changed and her eyes got wide and I forgot about her gray hair and her dark suit. To squeak the truth, my fur was on end. The story had a funny ending because it turned out the ghost wasn't a ghost at all. It was an owl. At the end of the story, everybody laughed, even Mrs. Brisbane. I was beginning to think that life with this new teacher wouldn't be so bad. But I changed my mind when the bell rang at the end of the day and all my classmates raced out of the room, leaving me alone with her. She erased the blackboard and gathered up her papers. I could tell we'd be going home soon. Suddenly I began to worry. What if Mrs. Brisbane lived in a scary house with spooky noises and a thumping ghost? Or even worse, what if she had a scary pet like a dog? My mind was racing fast as I was spinning my wheel when she finally approached and looked down at me frowning. And then she said, well, you're on your own now. With that, she closed the blinds and walked away. But I heard her mutter the word rodent under her breath. She left the classroom and closed the door. She left me all alone, all alone in room 26. I had never been alone before. As the room slowly do, drew, grew darker and quieter, I thought back to the happy time at Miss Mack's apartment. There was always cheery lights on and music, Oh dear, during the day, I never noticed how the clock on the wall in this classroom ticks off the seconds one by one. Tick, tick, tick. I started feeling sick, sick, sick. I wondered if there were any owls around room 26 or ghosts. I tried to pass the time by writing in my notebook about Petorama and my days at Miss Mack's apartment. Writing took my mind off my jittery nerves, but eventually my little paw began to ache and I had to stop my scratchings. If only I could roam free. Then I remembered the lock that doesn't lock. It only took a few seconds to jiggle the door open. I skidded across the table. Then, grasping the top of the table leg tightly, I closed my eyes and I slid to the ground. Ah, <gasps> freedom! I dashed along the shiny floor. I darted between the tables and chairs. I started to nibble a peanut <laughs> that somebody left under their chair. It tasted delicious, and it made a really cool punching sound. I chewed and chomped and gnawed and nibbled, and then I heard a sound. Thump, thump, thump. Just like the story Mrs. Brisbane had read to us. Thump, thump, thump. Closer and closer, down the hall, coming toward room 26. Then rattle, scratch, rattle, scratch, thump, thump, thump. Suddenly, I really wanted to be back in my cage. I dropped what was left of the peanut and I scrambled back. But when I got to the table, I thought a terrible thought. I had slid down the smooth leg straight down of the table, but how was I going to climb up again? I threw myself up against the table leg, grabbed on and pushed up, up, up but I had only made a little progress when I began to slide down, down, down. I was right back where I started. The rattling got louder. The sounds weren't coming toward the room anymore. They were coming into the room. Just then I noticed a long cord running down from the blinds. Without hesitation, I leaped up and grabbed the cord and began swinging back and forth. My stomach was churning and I wished I'd never even eaten that peanut. But with each swing, I got a little higher off the ground. As soon as I saw the edge of the table, I closed my eyes and swung and dived toward it. Whoosh! I slid across the table and I scampered into the cage and I pulled the door behind me. 
Suddenly, the lights came on. Somebody was in the room, clomping across the floor. The sound was huge and heavy and coming right towards me. Then I saw it was a man. Well, well, who do we have here? A new student, the voice said. The man was smiling at me. My, that was a lovely piece of fur across his upper lip, a nice black mustache. And he bent down to look in at me. He said, I'm Aldo Amato, and who are you? I'm Humphrey, and you scared me to death, I told him. But as always, that just came out as squeak, squeak, squeak. Aldo looked at the sign of my cage. Oh, you're Humphrey. I hope I didn't scare you to death. I've come in to clean the room. I come every night. But where have you been? He rolled up a big cart with a mop and buckets and brooms. Oh, that's right, he said. Mrs. Brisbane came back today. She's a good teacher, you know, Humphrey. Been teaching here a long time. Wish I'd had a good teacher like her. Say, do you like music, Humphrey? Squeak, squeak, squeak. I tried to tell him I love music. Suddenly, a song came blasting out of the radio on his cart, and he set to work sweeping and mopping. But he didn't just dust and mop. He spun and he swayed. He hopped and he leaped. He twisted and he twirled. How do you like that floor show, he asked me. Got it? It's a floor show because I'm cleaning the floor. <laughs> and then Aldo roared the biggest laugh I ever heard. I thought his mustache might fall off. You like that? I'll show you real talent, Humphrey. Aldo Amato picked up his broom and very carefully stood it up with the very tip balancing on one outstretched finger. Wow, that is hard to do. It wiggled from side to side, but Aldo moved with the broom and managed to keep it balanced straight in the air for a long time. When he was finished, he took a bow. What do you think, he said? I could join the circus. Then he wiped his forehead with a big bandana and he sat down at the table where AJ usually sits. You know what, Humphrey? You are such good company. I think I'll take my dinner break with you. Do you mind? Please, 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 I squeaked. And he pulled his chair right up to my cage. Hey, you're a handsome guy like me. Here, a little bit of green won't hurt you, will it? And he tore off a piece of lettuce from his sandwich and he pushed it through the bars. Of course, I hid it in my cheek pouch. Good for you, Humphrey. Always save, save something for a rainy day. The two of us shared a very pleasant meal as Aldo told me about how he used to have a regular job where he worked during the day but then his company closed down and he couldn't find a job for a long time. He couldn't even pay the rent when he was lucky enough to get hired at Longfellow School, thank goodness. He was glad to get the job, but it's lonely working at night because his friends work during the day and they can never get together like they used to. I tried to squeak to him about all the creatures like me that are also nocturnal, and Aldo listened. I know you're trying to tell me something, Humphrey, but I can't tell what it is. Maybe you're just saying I'm alone. I'm not alone, after all, huh? I have you as company? Squeak, he understood. Aldo stood up and threw his trash into the plastic bag on his cart. Well, I have a lot of other rooms to clean. I have to clean the whole school, but I'll be back tomorrow night, and maybe I'll take my dinner break with you again. He pushed his cart toward the door, and he reached for the light switch. No, 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 I squeaked, dreading the thought of being in the dark again. He stopped and he said, I hate to leave you in the dark, but if I don't turn off the lights, I could lose my job. He clomped across the floor to the window. Tell you what, I'll leave the blinds open a little. There's a nice light right outside your window. And he turned off the lights and left. I ate the lettuce that I'd saved and I basked in the warm glow of the streetlight and my new friendship with Aldo. From the book on the guide to caring and feeding of hamsters, tip two is hamsters are not picky about their food and eat very little. Be sure to feed your pet a wide variety of tasty foods. And that's the end of chapter two. Next time we meet, which will be tomorrow, Thursday, I'll start with chapter three called The Two Faces of Mrs. Brisbane. Thanks for listening.